Remember in the section of this module about vector spaces, we said that the way that we could prove something was true in absolutely every vector space was to give a proof just based on the axioms of a vector space. That way we could be certain that a particular thing held in every vector space, and not just in some particular examples that we'd looked at. We're going to do the same thing in group theory. We'll prove some standard results about groups to be true in absolutely every group by giving a proof that just uses the axioms of, a group, the of group theory. So you'll remember those are the identity axiom, the axiom of inverses, and the associativity axiom. So let's get on with some of these basic results. The first one, which I mentioned before, is that a group has only one identity element. So the lemma here says that if G is a group with group operation star, then there is only one element E in G such that E star G and G star E are both equal to G for every little g and big G. So certainly at least one element exists because the first axiom of a group, the identity axiom, says that some such element E exists. And in fact what we're going to show is that there is only one such element. So let's suppose that this that we have two elements satisfying this. So let's suppose that for all little g and big G, I'm going to miss out the stars here. So G E and E G are equal to G. And E prime is another element satisfying the same thing. So as I mentioned before, a lot of the time in groups we omit the symbol for the binary operation to make writing down equations in groups simpler. So that's what I'm going to do here. G E means G star E and E G means E star G. So let's suppose this is true and then our job is to show that actually E must be equal to E prime. Well to show that we're just going to consider the product E times E prime. Well, on the one hand anything multiplied on the left by E is just the same thing again. So if we apply this in the special case where G is E prime then what we'll get is E prime. But now we know that E prime satisfies the identity axiom as well. So anything multiplied on the right by E prime is just that thing again. So we're going to use this. And what that will tell us is that E times E prime is just E again. Okay, so E is equal to E prime. That means there's only one identity element in a group, and we can talk about the identity element to refer to the unique thing that satisfies the identity axiom in a group. We're now going to prove uniqueness of inverses. So the second axiom of a group, the inverse axiom, said that for every element x in a group there exists an element y such that x star y and y star x are equal to e again. We're going to prove that there's only one such element y. In fact, you've seen this argument before. You'll remember it from, uh, from earlier on in 0007. All we do is say, well, let's suppose that yx equals x, y equals e, and zx equals x, z equals e. And then it's our job to show that actually y is equal to z. We're going, to do, we're going to do this carefully using the axioms for the group and only the axioms for a group. So let's begin with y. Well, y is equal to y times the identity element e. That's because of the identity axiom. Okay, well e is equal to x times z. So let's replace this e by x times z. So as you can tell, not only am I writing my group operation as if it were multiplication, I'm also using the word multiplication instead of combining things with the binary operation star. 
Again, what this helps us do is to use the algebraic skills we've already got from manipulating real numbers in the context of an arbitrary group. So what do we have? y times x times z, because x times z was the identity. But of course, we also have associativity. So this is the same as yx times z. OK, y times x was the identity. So I can now replace y times x with the identity, and I get e times z, which is, of course, z again, again, by the identity axiom. OK, we've shown that y is equal to z, and so there is only one element with the property that we put in the inverses axiom. So we can introduce some special notation for the unique element, which is an inverse, to a given group element. And what we do is just write x to the power minus 1, again, this kind of multiplicative notation, for the unique element satisfying that x times x to the power minus 1, and x to the power minus 1 times x is equal to e. So we can call this the inverse of x, because we know there's only one element, which is a multiplicative inverse to x in the sense of the inverse axiom, so in the sense of this statement here. So before we move on, let's just think a little bit about two-sided and one-sided inverses. When we talked about functions, we introduced the idea of a left inverse and a right inverse and a two-sided inverse. And just because something was a left inverse to a particular function didn't mean it was necessarily a right inverse. And just because something was a right inverse didn't mean it was necessarily a left inverse. For example, there were functions which only had a left inverse and no right inverse, and there were functions which only had a, left in, a right inverse and no left inverse. But in groups, that doesn't happen. In a group, if you have x times y is equal to the identity, so it looks like y is a right inverse to x, then actually y is the two-sided inverse to x. y is x to the minus 1. And the reason for that is as follows. So if we had... Oops. Wrong tool... So if we have x times y equal to the identity, so y satisfies the uh, definition of being a right inverse, then actually y is a left inverse as well. So y, in fact, y is equal to the two-sided inverse x to the minus 1. And the reason for that is you can just take this equation, multiply it on the left by the inverse of x. So x inverse times x times y is equal to x inverse times e. Now, strictly speaking, I should have brackets on that left-hand side, but because my operation is guaranteed to be associative, I don't actually need them. So now on the right, what have I got? x inverse times the identity, and that's x inverse. And on the left, well, I've got x inverse times x, and I can choose to do that, that bit of the multiplication first if I like, because we're in uh, an associative situation. So x inverse times x is actually the identity. So we've got the identity times y, which is just y. All right, so as soon as something, as soon as y is a one-sided inverse to x, then actually it is the two-sided inverse as well. So this argument only works in groups, but in groups, if you found a right inverse to x, then that right inverse is actually the two-sided inverse to x. And similarly, if you found a left inverse to x, then that left inverse would also be the two-sided inverse to x. OK, let's now look at these things called the cancellation laws in a group. So the statement of the cancellation laws is this. If you have a group G with binary operation star, and if you have three elements X, Y, and Z of G, then if X star Y is X star Z, it must necessarily be that Y is equal to Z. So that's the left cancellation law. And the right cancellation law is that if Y star X is equal to Z star X, then Y must be equal to Z. And you can see why this is called the cancellation law. It's because it, what it allows you to do is cancel the z, the x, sorry, on the right, just and, and deduce that actually y must be equal to z. So let's see why this is true. And the reason is you can just multiply on the left by x inverse or on the right by x inverse to get rid of that x. So here goes the proof. If x y equals xz. Again, I'm just going to write multiplication by juxtaposition. I'm going to miss out the stars. Well, then 
we can multiply on the left by x inverse. And we don't have to bother with any brackets, like I said before, because the operation in a group is guaranteed to be associative. So if I like, I can decide to do the x inverse times x product first. And what I get there is the identity times y is identity times z. So y is equal to z. OK, so that proves the left cancellation law, the first one of those two parts of the lemma. And of course, you can prove the second one in exactly the same way by multiplying on the right by x inverse. OK, and one of the most interesting things about group theory is that the group axioms seem you know, they're very simple. There's only three of them. Many, many, many different structures are groups, many things which look seemingly completely different. So it's very remarkable that actually you can say a great deal about the structure of a finite group. In fact, one of the great mathematical achievements of the 20th century was what was called the classification of finite simple groups, which proved that any finite group is built up in a certain precise way from certain building blocks called the finite simple groups. And these came in a small number of infinite families and also a relatively small number of special exceptions. It's truly one of the most remarkable pieces of mathematics that, um, that has ever, ever, ever appeared. And we can see a kind of shadow of these classification results by thinking about groups with particular small orders and trying to think about what can we say about a group with a special, with a small order or with a certain property. So what we'll do on this slide is we're going to try and see what we can say about a group of size 2. So if a group has size 2, then, well, it must contain the identity element. Every group has an identity element. So G consists of an identity element and something else. So let's introduce some notation to begin with then. So G must be equal as a set to an element E, X, where E is the identity and x is not. So it's supposed to have size 2, so x should be an element which is different to e. So in order to characterize this group, to get all the information we can possibly get about its group operation, what we should do is work out all of the possible products. Now most of the products are not very interesting. The identity times the identity must be the identity again, it's part of the identity axiom. And the identity times x, or x times the identity, those things must both be equal to x, again, just because e is equal to the identity element. So the only interesting thing is what happens when I do x times x. OK, well, we've got two possibilities. Um, it must be another element of the group. Remember, star is supposed to be a binary operation on the set G. So when you combine two things using the binary operation, you must always get another element of G. So the answer here must be either E or X. OK, what's your bet? Which do you think? Um, pause the video and decide which one it is for yourself. OK, I hope you did that. Um, let's suppose, for a contradiction, that x star x is equal to x. Then I'm going to multiply by the inverse of x. So x must have an inverse. We don't know what it is, but it must have one. So I'm going to drop my stars here. x inverse times x times x is equal to x inverse times x. OK, what have we got on both sides? On the right, I've got something times its inverse, so that will always be the identity element. On the left, well, if I choose to bracket it like this, which I'm allowed to do because of associativity, then what I've got is identity times x. OK, but the identity times x is x again. That's the defining property, or half of the defining property of the identity. OK, I've ended up with x equal to the identity. This is a contradiction. That's not possible. Uh, we were assuming that x was the element of g, which was not the identity. So x star x cannot be x. It must therefore be x star 
x equals e. OK, we now know everything about this group of size 2. And we can even draw its multiplication table. The binary operation was star. The elements were e and x. And let's fill them in. Um, e is the identity, so e star e is e, and e star x is x, and x star e is x. And as we just worked out, x star x was equal to e. So that tells us that what goes here is e. So we've now worked out all the possible products in G, so we know everything about G. And we now know what any group of order 2 looks like. So any group of order 2 has this structure. It consists of two elements, one of which is the identity and one of which isn't. And the multiplication table looks like the one we've just drawn up. So we have done what's called classified. Um, we have classified all groups of order 2. We found out what structure they must have. OK, so a final comment then in this second video on group theory is about the associativity law. So the associativity law, the third axiom in the definition of a group, was that if G is a group, and if X and Y and Z are elements of G, then X multiplied into Y times Z is equal to X multiplied Y into Y times Z. So I'm using the word multiplication to refer to the group operation here, whatever that group operation might be. Now it turns out that this associativity law for products with three things implies that any way of bracketing a product of any length gives the same result. So even in complicated products, products which are longer than three things, you can always remove the brackets because any way of bracketing gives the same results. For example, if you were multiplying four things together, x times y times z times w, it doesn't matter if you do them like this or like this or like this. You always get the same answer. So this is not an obvious property. It does follow from the associativity law for products of length 3, but you have to do a little bit of work to prove this. Uh, if you'd like to see a proof of this, you can look it up in one of the books uh, which is suggested in the further reading or in the suggested reading for Math 0007 on the Moodle page, or you can try and prove it yourself. Um, but for this reason, we will very often just omit brackets from products and groups, no matter how long the products are.